Chapter 401 There was almost nothing intact in the hall. The Death Eaters had done most of the damage, and if Harry had recently realized that there was a huge skill gap between him and those wizards, he was now beginning to roughly grasp its size. They didn't just play with him and his squad, they didn't even raise a wand against them, you might say. Suddenly the stones, large and small, that had fallen from above onto Night's Fall, moved, and in a moment, as if they were made of foam, moved aside, showing everyone unharmed, but in a slightly torn coat, a living Max. I'd forgotten I'd be tougher under the strengthening, he said quietly, shaking the dust off his coat. None of the Death Eaters were taking any action, but Harry noticed a shadow creeping swiftly up from behind Max. Could it be one of them? Harry saw that Max noticed it too, but he only smiled. How about a magic trick? No one answered him, waiting. Only the rustle and creak of stone chips under his feet sounded in the hall. I'm gonna make, Max pulled a second wand from his pocket, this wand disappear. This movement of his provoked a shadow that had crept up almost close to him to attack sharply, rushing at Max clearly faster than a human could do. It was the Death Eater, holding a long knife. With an incredibly quick movement, Max managed to parry the lunge from his back, and with lightning speed, he plunged a second wand into his enemy's eye. ta -da -am! The Death Eater fell backwards to the floor, frozen with no sign of life, and the tip of the wand's hilt sticking out of his eye at an angle, as if going into his neck. It didn't evaporate. Whoops. These words served as a trigger, and fast and powerful dark beams of spells flew toward Max, without further ado, but Max literally scattered in darkness, immediately settling to the floor. The spell beams exploded, burned, and reduced to ashes several cubic meters of stone where the blonde man had just been. In the next second, a black silhouette rose from the floor behind Crouch Jr. It swung an equally black sword upward from below, cutting the wizard apart, disappearing again, but growing under the guy's dome of protection. And now into a defensive position, said the black silhouette in Max's voice, immediately turning into the guy himself, who began to apply more and more protective charms with incredible speed, strengthening the dome of the Protego to absurd indicators. It was no longer just a gray translucent film interspersed with Hermione's charms. It was already a nearly opaque, luminous shield, and the multiple beams of spells began to beat helplessly against it. Wasting no time, Max began to examine the injured guys, waving a wand over them. No one dared to say anything, focusing on defense and preparing to restore something at any moment. As a result, the guys did not notice how white clumps of smoke burst into the hall, engaging in a fierce battle with the remnants of the Death Eaters. However, after a few seconds, the Death Eaters began to retreat. Where's Potter? Max asked the guys, and suddenly everyone looked at each other. What? Where did that... that bastard? Max quickly stepped out of the field of protection, removing it, and the guys, still in a state of shock, bristled at Moody and Tonks with their wands. Calm down, folks, Moody grinned. Where's Potter? He was here a moment ago, Hermione said, looking strangely in the direction Max was supposed to run off to. Where are the Death Eaters? Retreating, Tonks hurried over to the students, who suddenly began to settle to the floor, hiding their eyes exhaustedly. You all need to go to the hospital right away. Moody took something out of his pocket and began to say quickly but quietly that Potter had disappeared again. Chapter 402, Kauror I ran as fast as I could the down corridors and stim ministry in near total darkness. My gut was telling me where Potter had gone, but much better than intuition, I could tell by the sheer volume of magic that literally exploded nearby. The saddest thing was that the forced load almost drank me to the bottom. Tough creatures, those Death Eaters. It's very good that I killed Dalahov first. He managed to give out more than a third of the total destruction and spells from the Death Eaters for the whole fight in a few seconds. An expert in his field. Bella also turned out to be good, though her attacks are very spot on, and a couple of times, she almost killed me. And now I'm dragging my feet, being not very sure of my sanity, hurrying after Potter. There's the atrium and disappointment. I wanted to see it. I really wanted to. In the middle of a dilapidated long hall, in which about half of the entire floor and walls covering remained, 
where the statues that stood on the fountain lie broken and fused in a completely different place. Potter was kneeling, banging his forehead on the floor and pounding it with his fists. Dumbledore was sitting on the floor with his back against the partition between the two fireplaces, bleeding and breathing heavily. A bald Voldemort in a black Jedi costume and a black cloak walked back and forth around this whole composition. As soon as I appeared in the hall, he immediately noticed me. Ah, Mr. Knight, he smiled broadly, and I tried to get away with shadows. As soon as I started forming them, Voldemort simply waved his hand, and I was pushed forward, rolling across the floor almost to Dumbledore's body, still alive. You should say goodbye to your beloved headmaster, Voldemort scoffed, pacing back and forth and spreading magic around him in huge volumes. Intentional or not, it didn't matter, but I could sense the meaning of such chimerism, as well as the benefits in terms of power. I'll even be so gracious that I won't interfere because I have something to discuss with Harry Potter, don't I? Voldemort abruptly appeared next to Potter. I just now realized how exhausted he really was, but at the same time, he didn't forget to keep us all in sight, bending over Potter and whispering something to him quietly. You will laugh, Mr. Knight, Dumbledore muttered, smiling sadly. His half-glasses were no longer on, but I slipped on my own robe at a crucial moment. I clearly felt in magic that the headmaster was no longer a fighter, but he had enough strength to try to get up, and I helped him in that endeavor. Voldemort was wary, but not much. He also seemed to understand the deplorable situation of Dumbledore, and he did not perceive me at all as an opponent. And you're not his opponent right now. You've put in a lot of powers. Voldemort is also not in the best condition right now, and you could compete with him, but it's unlikely that you will be able to overcome him, and you won't be able to use a sword in close combat. He just won't let you near him with the volume of magic. Chimera. Suddenly, the fireplaces began to blaze with green fire, and Voldemort erected a pillar of some kind of ash shield around himself and Potter. Wizards in a variety of clothes, from civilians to aurors, poured out of fireplaces, and Fudge was at the head of this procession. When they saw the Dark Lord, everyone froze. I hate prophecies, I muttered, supporting the headmaster and apparently preventing him from falling. I understand you so well, he nodded. Voldemort circled around Potter for a few more seconds, saying something inaudible to us, and then he looked at the headmaster and me. You know what, old man, grinned Voldemort. I won't kill you now. I see that you've managed to pick up a deadly, unremovable curse somewhere. I can feel death slowly coursing through your veins and I will leave you to die from it so that you can feel the full depth of your powerlessness against me, Lord Voldemort. Then he disappeared in a black whirlwind. Lee, having an unhappy and broken potter, there was silence in the ruined atrium for some time. He's really back, muttered Fudge. Voldemort is back. Amazing foresight, the headmaster smiled sadly. It's time for us to go to the hospital, it seems to me. Chapter 403 To the hospital wing of Hogwarts, the headmaster, the shocked potter, and I left by the fireplace from the ministry atrium. Strangely enough, Madame Pomfrey, who immediately came out to us, found only severe exhaustion in everyone, plus a minimal amount of various minor injuries. I was hurt, too, and mostly not from spells, but from becoming a projectile that plowed the stone floor and the benches in the hall with the archway. Dumbledore easily managed to convince Madame Pomfrey that we didn't need any special treatment and that we needed to talk in his office urgently. Reluctantly, Madame Pomfrey let us go, reproaching us for our irresponsible attitude toward our health. What about the others? As if waking up for a moment from his depressed and broken state, Potter spoke. They will be brought by people from the Order, the headmaster replied soothingly as we walked through the corridors of the castle. And Sirius? What about Sirius? He's not allowed into Hogwarts. Sirius has someone to take care of him at headquarters as well. But, Potter wanted to be indignant, but was immediately interrupted by just one serious look from the headmaster. If Sirius hadn't left headquarters and tried to constantly violate security regulations, nothing would have happened. Wouldn't it, Mr. Potter? He had nothing to answer, and we got to the headmaster's office in silence. 
The darkness of night had no power over the office, lit by the fire in the fireplace and the bright glare of the open cabinet with the pensieve. Dumbledore reached the chair behind his desk and sat down, letting the emotion of physical relief show on his face for a second. But he didn't let himself relax for long, gesturing for us to sit in the chairs opposite and leaning on his left arm. Potter looked tired and exhausted, and the abrasions and various external injuries gave him the appearance of some ragamuffin from the street. You took the prophecy, didn't you, Mr. Potter? The headmaster asked, looking at the guy. Harry glanced at me briefly, but decided that since the headmaster was asking about it in my presence, then it was okay. Yes, headmaster. When we ended up in the Hall of Prophecy, I noticed it almost immediately. Among many others? Yes, headmaster. As soon as I picked it up, the Death Eaters appeared immediately, dragging Sirius behind them. Barty Crouch, I mean Junior, was clearly leading them. They demanded the prophecy in exchange for Sirius and his life. Why, Headmaster? Couldn't they have taken it themselves? You see, Mr. Potter, the Headmaster tried to sit up more comfortably but only achieved a slight pain, judging from his face. The prophecy records are arranged in such a way that only the one about whom the prophecy is about can take them. So, what happened to the prophecy? Voldemort took it, Harry clenched his fists. I, I can't figure out how I ended up there myself. You, Mr. Potter, Dumbledore managed, even in such a gloomy and not the most illuminated atmosphere, to flash the half-moon spectacles that he put on who knows when, you fell out right in the middle of our fight in the apparition funnel. Wait, what? I couldn't contain my surprise. Isn't the entire ministry protected from apparition? Absolutely, Mr. Knight, Dumbledore nodded, but I think I know the reason for this. May I ask? Perhaps, but first I would like to ask Mr. Potter what forced him to apparate, and when did he acquire such curious skills? Um, Harry didn't hesitate, no, he just stared at the headmaster's desk, trying to formulate his thoughts. The guys and I have been practicing different spells. At that moment, the flames in the fireplace lit up green, and the headmaster and I pulled out our wands almost simultaneously, but made no other movements. Moody came out of the flames, tapping his staff on the floor, and cheerfully moving towards the vacant chair next to us. Mordred knows what, he exclaimed, limping. As soon as Alastor sat down heavily in a chair, straightening his prosthetic leg, he imidi, idly reached into his bosom, taking out a flask from there. The smell of alcohol immediately spread through the office. After taking a couple of sips and wiping his mouth with his sleeve, the old Auror looked at us. What are you staring at? We didn't catch anyone. Those bastards worked the getaway like never before. I wouldn't be surprised if Crouch was developing the operation. May the devils roast him in hell for eternity. Are you a believer? asked Potter immediately. No, Harry, Alastor shook his head but I fucking love the idea of such an afterlife for these creatures. Alastor, the headmaster looked reproachfully at Moody, but the latter only brushed him off. You were breaking the defenses, weren't you? Yeah, we were breaking while you and that rascal Fletcher, who is only good to get somewhere, were unraveling the blocking of fireplaces. We were just about past the defenses. Moody took another sip of his swill, through the tunt putting the flask back, when the defenses suddenly collapsed. Well, we had one last push left. That's when it came down on our own ministerial defense. Just as I thought, the headmaster nodded. That's what broke the anti-apparation barrier. Then why didn't everyone apparate from there and there too? I couldn't understand the situation. And why didn't you do it yourself? I thought about it. Indeed, why didn't I apparate, although now I could accurately recall the changed magic? Well, my protection did not mean the isolation of those inside. Even I, when I took it off, first began to pass through the shields. I don't know. Somehow I got used to the idea that you can't apparate at Hogwarts and the Ministry. It's the same story here, the headmaster nodded. Back to Mr. Potter and his reasons for apparating. We're listening to you. Chapter 404 I, Potter looked up, looking straight into the headmaster's eyes. I felt like I really, really needed to be in that place. I saw Voldemort torture members of the Order who came to help. Rookie, ugh, spat, but only with a sound, Moody. Didn't even suggest that Voldemort himself put these thoughts into you? I have never been wrong when I saw things through his eyes, 
Potter clearly wanted to be outraged, but he didn't have the physical and moral strength for this. Neither did he have the strength to fix his cracked round glasses. You think you can't make a mistake? I glared at Potter. But the decisions you make could get you and everyone who follows you killed. Do you understand that? I should have abandoned him, he looked defiantly. You should have notified the competent wizards about what happened. And Sirius is already an adult wizard, and he put you and your friends in danger with his antics. Voldemort has the prophecy. Well, well, the headmaster smiled reassuringly. Relax, everything ended well. It depends for whom, Alastor grinned, and in response to the headmaster's questioning look continued. This rookie caused such a beating in the death chamber. There was no stone left unturned, and there were seven casualties among the Death Eaters, including Crouch. Dumbledore looked at me reproachfully. Don't make that your face, grinned Moody, turning to the headmaster. As we understand it, Max has managed to get the Death Eaters under their own spells and curses. That's good to hear, the headmaster covered his eyes for a few moments. Mr. Knight, I'd like to thank you for your help. No need to, headmaster, I waved it off. I won't detain anyone anymore. You, Mr. Potter, I will ask you to stay. Alastor took a couple of parchments out of his coat, placed them on the headmaster's desk, and headed for the fireplace. I went to the office's exit, and then to the common room of the house. Wandering through the dark corridors of the castle, I was thinking about what to do and how to proceed. It is obvious that Voldemort will regret that he did not kill me on the spot, and after my escapade, he will definitely pay close attention to me which does not promise anything good. Some vague idea was persistently spinning in my head that it was time to move on to decisive and selfless measures. But how? Yes, and it's worth figuring out exactly what passed to me from Crouch's soul. Although I gave the sword the task of sending to rebirth, the sword still took some crumbs. What kind? It is not clear. As with the dragon, I still do not understand what I got from it. As soon as I entered the common room, the eyes of the few students gathered here from the senior courses were directed at me at the same moment. They were clearly curious, but they didn't seem to know the whole story yet, since not a single person involved in the recent mess was here. When I looked around, I didn't notice Hermione. Hermione came by? A couple of students shook their heads negatively. Maybe she decided to stay in the hospital wing? After leaving the common room, I went to the hospital wing. Even though it was the middle of the night, not a single teacher came across. In the hospital wing, Madame Pomfrey confirmed that Hermione was here, but already asleep under her potions, and anyway, the night is no time for visits. I left the hospital wing of the castle, and after putting on a variety of charms of concealment, I left Hogwarts altogether, having moved from the border of anti-apparition charms directly to London. The capital could please with an infrequent sight, snow, white and fluffy, right now, large flakes falling from the sky, bringing with them a sense of celebration. This holiday feeling was fueled by the various working establishments, brightly colored storefronts, Christmas decorations on houses, and couples or groups of people of various ages, beaming with good mood, subtly hinted that a little more, a couple of days, and Christmas would come. It even seemed that why I were about to hear the traditional chimes of bells on Santa's sleigh. Grinning at such thoughts, I moved along one of the central streets, the snow creaking under my feet. Thoughts about the need for decisive action formed in my head into something more definite. And the longer I walked, the more clear the suicidal plan became, immediately requiring implementation. Oh ho ho, came the familiar bird cry behind me, and out of habit, Putting my elbow to the side, I could watch Pirate land on it, as if on a perch. And what have you brought me? I smiled at the perpetually disheveled owl. Oh ho! Nothing? Oh ho ho! The pirate stared at me with one eye, opening it wide, and as if in shock. Hmm. You're not such a simple bird, are you, owl? Oh ho! Okay, I've got a job for you. Dropping my bag from my shoulder, I pulled out the parchment. I wrote a small letter on it with magic without a wand and handed it to the pirate, sending it to its destination. Now I could walk around the city some more. Chapter 405 When I reached Piccadilly on foot, deftly dodging the occasional person walking down the street, I heard the familiar oh-ho-ho ho, 
as the pirate sat on a lamppost a couple of meters away from me. As soon as I approached, the owl, in its usual manner, dropped the envelope, which had glided precisely into my hands, and then, with a hoot of a goodbye, flew away. I checked the envelope for surprises while it was still flying, so I opened it without fear, and after reading the text, I immediately apparated away. The spatial puncture of the apparition led me straight to the site for such movements, and opposite stood Delphine's country house, covered with snow, and the witch herself stood in a tightly wrapped robe on the threshold. Judging by the way the robe bulged a little in different places, it was clear to me that some thick clothes with fur or some other collar were under it. We moved towards each other, and the witch took out a small book from under the robe. I hope, she began instead of greeting, that you won't do anything rash. Purely for study purposes, I smiled, accepting the book and placing it in my bag, immediately throwing it over my shoulder. Thank you. When do you want it back? It's a copy. As the saying goes, burn after reading. Will do, I nodded, smiling again. Thank you. Delphine nodded and escorted me back to the grounds, from where I apparated straight to Grimaud Place, into the now familiar dark passage. After checking the surroundings with the architect's abilities and not finding anything suspicious, I quickly got to the twelfth house and went inside. Silence. After hanging my coat on a hanger in the hallway, I cleaned myself of snow and dirt with magic, then went to the hall with a portrait of Walburga. A wonderful night for a walk, isn't it? A painted witch greeted me, contrary to expectations, drinking a glass of no less painted wine. You are right, Lady Walburga. However, I have no time to talk, and therefore, please excuse me. Young people, the lady uttered profoundly, taking a sip of wine. Always rushing somewhere, hurrying, chasing one thing, losing another along the way, and not appreciating what you have. That's not we. That's life, I replied, heading for my office. I heard a quiet and not at all aristocratic snort, showing Walburga's attitude to what I said. Creature, I said quietly, make me a snack. I'm in my office. Even though the house elf didn't show up, I know he heard me, and so I had no doubt that there would be a snack. Entering the office and inhaling the familiar and pleasant air, filled with the aroma of expensive wooden furniture and subtle notes of books in the cabinets, I quickly sat down at the armchair and took out the book I received from Delphine from my bag. I was only interested in one thing in this book, how a horcrux is created. Although it is worth reading any other black stuff that is in these Secrets of the Darkest Arts. A minute later, various light snacks appeared on the table, but I was already completely absorbed in fast reading and data processing. Nasty book. Perhaps the most disgusting of all I have read in the restricted section and in the Black's library. Lines, diagrams, and descriptions of various magical manipulations calmly fit into the existing knowledge in my head, forming a kind of the whole picture. It was only in the morning that I finished with the book, destroying it with the help of Incendio and leaning back in an easy chair, allowing my consciousness to process the information. Morning tea, dear head, Creature called out to me, but I was only glad of such a thing. The old house elf put a tray with a mug of tea, a teapot, and a plate of very sweet cakes on an empty place at the table, just what my brain needed. Thank you, Creature, I nodded, starting on such a breakfast. Old Creature is glad to serve the head of the noble and most ancient house of Black faithfully. Sometimes he says such lines, but I think it's useless to do something here, and it's pointless. Chapter 406 After breakfast, I noticed that the horizon was beginning to lighten outside the window, which meant it was time to move on to the second stage of the experiment. I went down to the first floor and headed for the exit. I put on my coat and enchanted myself with the charms of concealment and so on, and apparated, not just anywhere, but to a dead end in the backyard of the leaky cauldron. Why hadn't I thought of that before? The rules of decency are observed because I didn't apparate into the house. The law is observed, and the charms are not disturbed around the Diagon Alley. You can't apparate from there and there. Quickly opening the passage, I slipped like an invisible shadow into the still empty alley, the stores and shops of which were still closed, and the rare magic lanterns flooded everything with a dim yellow light. Without wasting any time, I headed to Nocturne Alley, 
The goal is a few hot spots, the memory of which was preserved by Rowena after my personality disorder. It was in these places that I was looking for someone to experiment on. While walking along the alleys, in which the light of day is a rare guest, I thought about a simple question. Why does there even exist such a place as Nocturne Alley? The answer comes by itself. Control. If you pin down all these magical incompetents, homeless people, petty thieves, smugglers, and other rabble, then it will automatically go to the outside world, because since they are here, they do not have the skills to make their own safe corner. They'll scatter everywhere, make a mess, threaten the statute of secrecy with their inability to conceal their magic, and so on. And here, in Nocturne Alley, allowing the rabble to live, the Ministry keeps it under control, and petty crime is petty enough not to be of interest. The big players, like Borgen and Burks, probably live on kickbacks. Outspoken criminals are being eradicated. At least during that short time of my acquaintance with Nocturne Alley, the owners of several specifically black businesses changed here, and the businesses themselves didn't live long, once turning into ashes. This is one of those firms, new but still alive, that interests me. After passing a couple of suspicious characters, I got to a basement in a ramshackle old stone building and lurked across the street. I waited till dawn, and it was only at first light that a slightly hunched, a massive wizard came out of the basement, from under the black hood of his cloak, an evil and cold look of a seasoned murderer looked at the world. I saw such. Not a maniac, but a murderer. Without any wands or extra movement, I sent a few paralyzing ones at the wizard, he managed to fight off two of them instantly, but missed the third, falling backwards. I added a few more to be sure, then put him to sleep and transfigured his body into a statuette, immediately using telekinesis and putting it in my pocket. Within a few hours, I had a few more test subjects to experiment with, and after some successful target captures, I walked briskly out of Nocturne and then left the Diagon Alley, apparating back to Grimald. Without explaining anything to anyone, I walked briskly down to the ritual hall with its smooth walls and floor. I sat on the floor there and began to think about the Horcruxes in more detail, using Rowena's resources in the process. It turned out that to create a Horcrux properly, in the understanding of the author of the book, you need three things, a ritual scheme or its equivalent in the form of a spell, a means to shatter the stability of the soul, and an object that will eventually become a horcrux. The ritual scheme was shown in the book, and its complexity is not too great, something like the soul catcher. It collects and holds either the scattered fragments of the soul or some large part of it. In the case of fragments, the ritual mixes them up thoroughly and then places it in an object, locking it there in a special way. If a piece of the soul is whole, then the mixing stage is omitted. The questy on is how to damage the soul. Not mine, no. I don't need it. Someone else's. A banal way comes to mind. Use Crucio to the point of insanity. You think right, in the words that sounded in my head from Rowena, you could literally feel the consonant nods. I have been analyzing the methods of influencing the soul for several months, relying on your both magical and ordinary knowledge and theories. And what conclusions have you come to? There is a high probability that the soul has some infinitesimal particle in all understandings, which is a kind of core. This idea is suggested by theories about the structure of matter, because ordinary science now and then discovers particles that make up larger ones. It is quite possible that sooner or later, some basic particle will be discovered. But that's not the only thing. The horcruxes known to us didn't show real independence in actions, didn't evolve, and didn't develop at least based on the available data. They, like a program, acted and influenced the world around them within the limits of the knowledge and worldview that they received at the time of creation. Interesting, and if to remember the old man's words when I just appeared before him, saying, you have not passed purification. It turns out that this very purification before rebirth was supposed to, to remove everything superfluous from life and send only the very core to be reborn. That's how I see it. It turns out that if the world holds the particles belonging to the soul, the wizard can keep himself from leaving the world if he wants and wishes to live. I think so too. But in order to do that,
the soul needs to retain the superfluous because it forms the personality, desires, mind, and so forth. Sounds logical. And so we will test this in the simplest and most effective way possible. Chapter 4 Hodo 7 Getting up from the floor and taking the wand in my hand, I directed the energy of hemomancy through it because control would be better through the wand. With a few bloody threads, I carved a not particularly intricate ritual scheme on the floor of the ritual hall, consisting of a couple of circles, triangles, and three dozen ancient runes. Throwing the bag off my shoulder, I found an almost worn-out pencil there and put it in place in the diagram where the object should lie for. Whore crucifixion? Whore cruxing? Doesn't matter. Taking the figurine of the first test subject out of my coat pocket, I shamelessly threw it into the center of the ritual scheme, canceling the transformation in flight, and a wizard in dark rags collapsed on the floor, asleep. Throwing Silencio, incarcerous at him, and awakening him with Renervate, I began to infuse the scheme of the ritual with magic, not paying attention to the wizard who silently imitated a caterpillar. When the drawings on the floor acquired a slight bluish glow, signaling the readiness of the scheme to capture the particles of the soul, I materialized the spirit sword, still black, with a greenish tint and a rough handle. The wizard began to depict the caterpillar more productively, and turning over on his stomach, began to crawl away bending his legs under him. With each step I took, I put a simple task before my sword more and more clearly, split the soul in two. When I got close to the wizard, I swung my sword, and I sliced the wizard in two with a sharp movement. To my slight but quickly passed surprise, the wizard himself remained intact, and the ritual scheme became red. The soul was caught, and the process of sealing it in pencil began. I leaned over the wizard and checked his vitals. They were normal. Well, except for the painful spasm of many muscles in his body, the rapid heartbeat, and a face distorted by pain. It took only a couple of seconds for the ritual scheme to finish its work and fade out, leaving behind only engraved patterns on the floor. The wizard was still alive. I walked over to the pencil on the floor and took it in my hands. A strange sensation, but somehow subtly similar to Riddle's diary. And the locket, of course. I went beyond the edge of the circuit and sat on the floor, waiting for the subject to come to his senses. After a couple of minutes, the test subject recovered, and after assessing his position, tried to crawl away again, carefully imitating a caterpillar. However, it remains a mystery to me, where is he actually going to run, in a confined space? Taking the wand in my hand again, I pointed to the test subject without further ado, sending a clot of cumularis into him scattering the wizard's body. Curiously enough, a clot of the fog of a gloomy, bluish hue hung in place of the body. It was small, no bigger than a tennis ball. This clot didn't seem to understand what it was doing here, and if you watch a little longer, you will notice that this clot seems to continue to crawl along the trajectory chosen by the subject. If it's a soul, then he didn't even realize he was dead, Rowena rightly pointed out. The clot began to fade as if it was going into invisibility. Without giving it such an opportunity, I literally jumped on the spot, instantly flying up to the clot and cutting it with a newly materialized sword, mentally giving the command to the sword, destroy. The clot literally flew apart in a rapidly disappearing cloud of fog, and in its place for a couple of moments hung a tiny, almost indistinguishable point of light, which literally fell into space. He's passed on. So with my sword, I destroyed all that was on his soul? And left without all this, that very piece no longer had any attachment to the Horcrux, as in fact memories, will, mind, and other things, and therefore freely left the world? It looks that way, but it needs confirmation. After destroying the Horcrux pencil with my sword, I pulled out the rest of the figurines. Time for experiments. Chapter 408 it took me almost a day of complete self-isolation in the ritual hall of the Black's home to get a strong headache at my disposal, along with more or less formed concepts of the soul, horcrux, and the capabilities of my sword. The first thing to note, and what is the most important achievement, is the firm belief that the soul really has a core around which everything else grows. Even if this confidence has no mathematical or any other scientific justification, but the usual observations of the course of experiments were enough for me. 
I even had to ask Creature to catch or buy some animals for the variety and purity of the experiment. He fulfilled this request. Experiments with the creation of horcruxes of animals made it clear that a certain core of the soul of humans and animals looks and feels the same. Still, everything else that accumulates around this core is different both qualitatively and quantitatively. The second important observation is that the cleansed core really has no connection with the horcrux, the anchor, can be called in different ways. Yes, Rowena and I thought about this after the first experiment, but all subsequent experiments have shown that it is the fat that the core has grown over during life, being separated and protected from the dispersion by binding to matter. That is the reason why a soul with the remnants of fat, if there is will and desire, can remain in the world. I even conducted one experiment in which I separated the soul of a subject, but I didn't make a horcrux out of the resulting part, but simply kept it in the ritual scheme. While the shard is inside the circuit, the soul of the murdered subject still remains in the world, but as soon as the scheme is broken, it seems to fall into space together with the shard. The third important observation is that my spirit sword is a unique tool for working with the soul. Of course, I understood this before, but now this understanding has acquired a slightly different level. Very specific magical skills, knowledge, and calculations are needed to work with the soul. Any attempt to do as wizards are used to, with a wave of a wand, always turns out to be a failure due to the huge consumption of magic or the disruption of the contours of almost formed spells. However, the sword, being a kind of materialization of my own soul, works perfectly with other souls. All these thoughts began to take shape, albeit not very clear, but the idea of how to kill Voldemort bypassing his horcruxes. I just need to cut him down. It sounds extremely easy and about as difficult to do. There is a lot of his own magic around him, and he can easily control this magic. Take, for example, one of the variants of telekinesis with the help of magic. You direct your magic in a trickle to an object and broadcast your desire to it, take off, or whatever. Voldemort is surrounded by a huge amount of magic, occupying about two meters in radius. In this zone, he doesn't need volitional efforts to perform simple manipulations with its help, and the sensitivity to magical and other manifestations should be simply enormous. Perhaps his magic takes up such a volume when he is in combat mode, but it is worth counting on the worst, taking as an axiom that this is his natural background. The problem here is that there's simply no way to get to him. No way, at all. All manipulations take time, and even to just fall out of the shadows and strike, I will need time for which he will easily react. Delphina has a magical background similar in nature, but there it is smaller and quieter. So does Dumbledore, but the volume is within reason. Unlike the density of magic, but the density is a product of control and active thinking. That's why when the headmaster manifests his magical power, it's as if he glows in perception. Without light, of course, as well as other visual manifestations, it is only an association, a kind of flicker from the density of magic. And Voldemort is pressing. It's hard to put that kind of feeling into words. You could so love this problem with a firearm, for example. Take a bullet, enlarge it with Engorgio, apply the necessary runes, return it to its original size, put it back in the cartridge, and that's it, the weapon is ready. However, this is only a means of killing the body, and I need to get Voldemort with a sword. It's possible to implement a soul catcher in a bullet, but the problem is that the soul catcher and the soul don't get along well together. This is related to the problem of the short shelf life of the soul in the soul catcher. And if the soul understands exactly what happened, it will be able to free itself. Well, at least I think so. And Voldemort has a lot of experience living without a body. After weighing all the pros and cons, having dined on Creature's culinary masterpieces, I left the house on Grimald. There wasn't a star in the already darkened London night sky, just a glow from the city in the clouds. There was almost no snow left from the recent snowfall, and the festive mood from various decorations no longer appeared. Christmas is tomorrow. Chapter 409, How to Get Close to Voldemort, or Break Through His Defenses. He is stronger, more experienced, and in the end, he's just angrier. This is important, given his dark, magical specialization. 
From a tactical point of view, I just need to wait for some kind of mess with his participation, guess the moment, and get closer by striking with a sword. But when will it be? It's hard to say. And problems can start at any moment. I have attracted his attention. I have to finish him off. If you believe the rumors at Hogwarts and Tonks' words, then cases of missing wizards have already become more frequent. I can bet that ordinary people as well. How to overpower Voldemort in a direct confrontation. Direct and uncompromising? I'm detecting the birth of a brilliant idea. Rowena's snide voice in my head knocked me off this very thought. Go see Delphine. Why? I said out loud, unwittingly, but it was this mistake that managed to get my thoughts back on track. Without warning about my visit in advance, I apparated at the coordinates known to me to the place to which I had access. Once on the apparition platform near Lady Greengrass's country house, which was still covered with snow, I walked along the path to the wooden mansion, inadvertently admiring the barely visible pale blue snow around and the tall coniferous trees of the forest standing very close to it. A soft yellow light was burning in the house's windows, which gave hope that Delphine was at home. When I reached the door, it swung open to let me in, and then slammed shut when I walked in. Standing in the vestibule, which was level below the general floor, I enjoyed breathing in the warm air with pine scents wafting through it. The source of the scent interested me, and as soon as I cleared myself with magic and walked into the spacious main hall, lit by the fireplace and a couple of lights, I immediately noticed the decorated Christmas tree. Everything on it was as it should be. Colorful, shiny balls of different sizes, stars, soft yellow lights like garlands. Without an invitation came Delphine's voice coming from the big sofa in front of the fireplace. There was no reproach in this voice, just a statement of fact. I walked across the hall and sat down in an armchair that stood, as it were, between the sofa and the fireplace. Delphine was sitting relaxed on this big sofa, dressed in a rather simple and long light dress. Her thick braid of almost white hair rested habitually on her right shoulder. In her hands, Lady Greengrass was holding a book that she had apparently been reading before my visit. Not much light, but enough, and there are spells for such situations. I apologize for the late unannounced visit, I apologized, looking at Delphine. She closed the book, placed it on her lap, and looked back at me. Has something happened? I need your help. Delphine nodded, like, go on. But I turned my gaze to the decorated Christmas tree. Christmas? A good reason for a beautiful decoration, Lady Greengrass shrugged. Can you arrange the same ritual as last time? Why? I stared at Delphine for a few seconds and didn't know exactly what to say. But what's the point of spreading secrecy out of the blue? In that state, I plan to destroy the Dark Lord. Delphine opened her eyes wide in surprise, looking at me. What nonsense! She shook her head dejectedly. Lady Greengrass. But Delphine interrupted my beginning speech with a stopping gesture of her hand. I didn't spend a lot of time and effort on your training so that you would go and kill yourself at the Dark Lord. I have calculated and thought everything out. You're forgetting about the prophecy, she said somewhat harsher. And we don't know its contents, I responded similarly to her. Dumbledore is silent, and Potter has lost this prophecy. That's it. And if indeed only young Mr. Potter is capable of defeating the Dark Lord, then how will your fight end, no matter how strong you make yourself? I'll slip on my robe like Dumbledore. Delphine looked at me, I, in surprise, you don't know yet? Chapter 410 Without much enthusiasm, simply and factually, I told about the recent events at the Ministry. Delphine listened calmly, without emotion, clarifying only a few points of interest to her. You have revealed yourself too much, she stated the obvious fact when I finished my story. The Dark Lord let you go, but he didn't know yet how much damage you did to his elite. Now he knows for sure, and you really caught his attention. That's why I need this ritual, all in, so to speak. Delphine shook her head again. It's not easy for me to decide to hand you the means to go on a suicide mission. So, look at it from a different angle, I smiled. You will hand me the means so that by going, I will not kill myself. What about the prophecy? If there is even a slight chance that only Potter can defeat the Dark Lord because of it, then all your attempts will be useless and will only lead you, at best, to death. 
I was a little hesitant here, but as I know, it is extremely difficult to break the prophecy, and forces outside of this world are capable of doing so. Even if you consider that I appeared before the utterance of the prophecy, my spiritual weapon arrived years after the utterance of the prophecy. There's a good chance it could be considered an out-of-this-world force. I have to try. I don't know, and I'm afraid to even guess how long it will take for Potter to defeat the Dark Lord. Six months? A year? Ten years? What can happen during this time? Already now, by circumstantial evidence, we can count at least a dozen victims among wizards and an unknown number among ordinary people. There will be more. You're worried not about them, are you? Smiled Delphine weakly, looking at me. It wasn't so much a question as a statement. Yes, I decided not to lie. I am concerned about my well-being and the people important to me. The activities of the Dark Lord, which he may soon promote, as well as his attention to me, are not at all conducive to that well-being. Well, and time is working against me. Delphine looked at me in silence, tapping her index finger on the cover of the book lying in her lap. She was clearly thinking about something. How to bury me herself so that others wouldn't get that honor. All right, after all, if I don't help, you'll come up with some unusual way to get what you want on your own. Right. The corners of Delphine's mouth twitched slightly, expressing a very slight smile. Come back in three days. I'll prepare everything. Judging by the fact that Delphine opened the book again right after that sentence, I could tell that she was somewhat disappointed, offended. In general, she expressed her displeasure. Thank you. I smiled and, getting up from the chair, went to the exit of the house. When I reached the apparition site, I moved to the border of the protective barrier of Hogwarts and, on the move, conjuring a complex of concealing charms on myself, hurriedly moved to the castle. When I got inside, I wasn't surprised by the silence and the dimmed lights. Lights out. After sneaking in quietly and passing McGonagall patrolling the castle, I had no trouble getting to the common room, where some of the members of the recent Operation to Rescue Sirius were found. Taking off my disguise, I proceeded to an empty sofa and with some fatigue simply flopped down on it, spreading myself unwillingly on such a comfortable seat. My return didn't go unnoticed, but only the twins approached me. Max, the left one, spoke, keeping an atypical seriousness on his face. We wanted to thank you. To my surprise, the other twin did not continue the sentence. For what? For saving us, the first said again, and the second only nodded. Your advice on spells for training, your help at the ministry, without that, we could have easily died. I could only nod at that. After a quick look around the common room, I noticed other members of that action, along with the ordinary members of Dumbledore's army. Yes, not everyone was here. Yes, there were guys for um, other houses, but it's not uncommon. Friends bring friends. Are you thanking me on behalf of everyone else? Don't get them wrong, the other twin smiled a little sadly. They're grateful too, just afraid of you. Everything came back to normal, and the twins began to finish phrases one for the other. Afraid? Well, of course, the second one smiled sparingly. You've shown yourself to be a very powerful wizard. We haven't seen anything like this yet. And how should I say? Killed, the first twin finished clearly, immediately placing his palms out in front of him in a defensive gesture. No, no, we don't blame you. After all, they were the wizards without whom the world would be a better place. And Azkaban has proven to be no panacea. Okay, guys, where's Hermione? In her room, I think. Probably asleep. It's late. And she hasn't looked up from her books since we got back. Thanks, I nodded to the guys, and they nodded back and returned to the others. There was nothing else for me to do in the common room, so I went to shower and sleep.